before we understand what retention is in orthodontics, let's understand what is relapse. Calvin Case has famously said, permanent retention is a part of orthodontic treatment. I'll give you one example. Say a person has a hand fracture and the orthopedic surgeon will perform a surgery to put those two fractured segments together, align them and suture the skin back and the tissues back in place. When the surgeon does that, does he or does he not permanently fix them together by using metal screws and plates? He does. Similarly, after the orthodontic treatments, it's impossible, almost impossible to retain all the corrections that have been obtained at the end of orthodontic treatment. Simply put, after orthodontic treatment, the treatment is not actively complete. Retention forms an important part of the treatment. It is up to the patient to continue to wear orthodontic retainers and hence maintain the corrections that have been obtained at the end of the treatment. So a patient's commitment to orthodontic treatment is also important. Educating the patient on the importance of orthodontic retention will help decrease the chance of risk that can take place after removal of fixed appliance. What exactly is neutral zone? So neutral zone is an imaginary zone which is basically representing the area along which the teeth are lying at rest. So you can imagine this being the neutral zone. For the maxillary arch and over here this is a neutral zone for the mandibular arch in this zone the teeth are at rest and no undesirable changes in position are seen of the teeth that means that the forces that are exerted by the tongue on the inside and the forces exerted by the lips the cheek and other facial muscles on the outside are somehow nullified so that the teeth continue to remain in a stable position and hence it's called the neutral zone because no outward or inward force is exerted on the teeth. If teeth at the end of orthodontic treatment remain in this neutral zone then the outcome of the treatment is relatively more stable and there is a lesser chance of relapse. So let's study the etiological factors which can result in relapse. We can probably divide them under three categories, growth factors, soft tissue factors, gingival and periodontal factors and occlusal factors. When we talk about growth factors, I can give you an example of a skater class C pattern where mandible is prognathic and maybe you do an orthodontic treatment and correct that prognathism or skater class C appearance into a class 1 appearance or less prominent class C appearance. At the end of the treatment, the aesthetics have improved, the function has improved. But if it is a kind of patient where the growth is still present, maybe it is a 20-year-old adult, 19-year-old adult male, where some amount of growth is still present, obviously there is a higher chance of relapse because in men, growth continues until mid-20s, whereas in women, growth continues until early 20s. So based on the amount of growth that is remaining, retention period may be prolonged. Next is soft tissue factors. Some example of soft tissue factor could be hyperactive muscles or uh, one example could be a large tongue. Say a patient has generalized spacing in upper and lower anteriors and after orthodontic treatment all the spaces are closed. And if this patient has a very large tongue or hyperactive tongue, in such cases there is a risk of relapse of that spacing. In the sense because of soft tissue factors that is in this case a large or a hyperactive tongue there can be relapse so this is one example where we can see how soft tissues can affect the relapse tendency of a malocclusion gingival and periodontal factors first of all gingival and periodontal health is of utmost important importance when we are when we start orthodontic treatment if your patient does not have a good gingival and periodontal health, orthodontic treatment may not be really helpful in that patient because overall health itself is compromised. 
Then gingival and periodontal tissues have their own role in relapse and we'll study about them in the next slide. The fourth factor is the occlusal stability. How stable is the occlusion also decides to which extent it may have relapse. If the patient's occlusion is not completely settled at the end of the treatment, then he or she has a higher tendency of having orthodontic relapse. Also, any occlusive interferences also can result in relapse in the patient. Now, the gingival and periodontal structures play an important role in relapse. The reason being, immediately after the fixed appliance is removed, the tissues are not exactly in a stable state. The alveolar bone itself has been undergoing n number of cycles of bone deposition and bone resorption during orthodontic treatment. So immediately after removal of fixed appliance, in some areas bone is yet to be deposited, bone is yet to be remodeled and calcified. So at least for one month, the alveolar bone is in a very plastic state and may not be stable enough to retain the new corrected position without a retainer. In this diagram, we'll learn which tissues take shorter and which take longer to stabilize after orthodontic. So over here, what do we have? We have, yeah, we have the alveolar bone. Similarly, alveolar bone is also present on the other side of this tooth. Imagine this being the mandibular central incisor and this is the alveolar socket in which the central incisor is very nicely positioned. Now, this empty space is not really empty. Over here, you can imagine periodontal ligament fibers are present, which are mainly containing collagen. These periodontal ligament fibers take over a period of three to four months to, to remodel to the new position of the tooth. So alveolar bone take one month to recalcify. The periodontal ligament fibers take three to four months to stabilize in the new position. Then on the mesial and on the distal aspect, we have got gingiva. Gingiva contains multiple fibers. The gingival collagen fibers take four to six months to reorganize. Last but not the least, just above the crest of the alveolar, alveolar bone, you've got supracrystal fibers. These supracrystal gingival fibers take eight to 12 months, almost a year to remodel. These fibers contain elastin. They're highly elastic in nature and they tend to pull the tooth back into its old position. This is particularly applicable in case of rotational correction. So if a patient has a rotator center incisor and the derotation is carried out and the patient does not wear the retainer at least for a year, there's a higher chance of relapse due to these supracrystal elastic fibers. Savila so bone takes one month to remodel and stabilize. The periodontal ligament fibers take three to four months. Gingival collagen fibers take four to six months. And the supracrystal elastic fibers take eight to 12 months to stabilize. Before we go further, we should understand some terminology. First is arch length. Arch length can be imagined as, okay, say imagine this is the maxillary arch. This rectangular structure is a maxillary arch. This being the incisor region. Over here, we have the maxillary molar on one side and another molar on the other side. So this length of the arch from anterior to the posterior, in the anterior posterior plane is called arch length. Now, why arch length is important? Researchers say that the arch length decreases with time. So as a person grows older, the arch length decreases in the individual. Basically, the maxilla continues to increase in the arch length up to 8 years, whereas the mandible up to 13 years. So mandible has a longer period of a longer duration over which the arch length increases. Of the length of the arch along the arch line. So going from molar over here, premolar, the canine in anteriors, similarly on the aden, this represents Retention in orthodontics consists of three parts. One is retainers. Retainers are orthodontic appliances which are given at the end of the orthodontic treatment so as to retain and maintain the corrections obtained by the orthodontic treatment. There are some other procedures which, are, which can be done to improve retention 
of orthodontic correction for example csf or circumferential supracostal fibrotomy or precision it's called ipr interproximal reduction or reproximation this can be discussed in the next class today we focus only on the retainers particularly hollis retainer and fixed retainer every patient needs an individual customized treatment plan and same retention regime cannot be given to each patient because every patient is unique every patient comes with a unique malocclusion he and she requires a unique treatment plan and similarly a unique retention plan is also needed the kind of retention plan that is to be given to a patient depends on several factors for example how was the initial occlusion how complex was the initial occlusion how stable is the occlusion at the end of the treatment what kind of a patient is he or she is he the kind of patient that is very compliant does he or she maintain good oral hygiene follow the instructions properly and um, how are the soft tissues is the periodontal health good are the muscles normal or are they hypo or hyperactive these are all the factors which can decide what kind of regime treatment retention regime is required for the patient so we can probably divide the retain retainers into fixed and example of fixed retainers are or we have bonded lingual retainers multi stranded wires which are bonded on each tooth they are bonded on the lingual surface of the tooth and every tooth from canine to the canine on one side or premolar to the premolar on the other side is bonded another example is rigid bar canine to canine retainer where only a single rigid bar extends from one canine on the lingual surface to the other canine on the lingual surface but then the rest of the teeth in between are not bonded to avoid manual errors these days cad cam processed nita wires are also available so manual errors can be avoided by using these cad cam or computerized wires when it comes to removable retainers we can divide them into passive and active so passive retainer one example would be classic hollis retainer another would be sx retainer an active retainer example would be positional and functional plans we'll discuss each in detail. now this is an example of fixed retainer fixed retainer of the multi stranded type so a uh, multiple strands are put together and they are twisted and they are bonded on the lingual surface of the maxillary canine similarly it can be also done on the mandibular usually the bonding is done from the canine on one side all the way up to the canine on the other side sometimes even the premolars are included what are the advantages chief advantage is that you don't depend on the patient for the compliance that is whether the patient cooperates or not there is retainer in the patient's mouth so the retention is present the retainer is always acting another advantage is it is very effective against rotational uh, relapse say a tooth has been derotated with the help of orthodontic treatment after applying fixed retainer there is a lesser chance of the tooth undergoing relapse but then it has disadvantages first and foremost is this is a very fragile wire and all that it is doing is extending from one canine to another it is not passing through and through the transverse plane so if a patient has cross bite in that case arch expansion is done to retain the cross bite some amount of arch collapse may take place if only this kind of fixed retainer is given for retention another reason why this may not be the best retainer plan is say one or two teeth get deponded the patient may not be completely aware that something is wrong with his or her retainer so if this happens between two subsequent appointments by the time the patient comes for a orthodontic checkup this or this tooth whichever tooth has got deponded that may already start showing signs of relapse so the patient is totally unaware of the problems that is happening on the lingual surface so this is another disadvantage of the appliance if the patient always he has poor oral hygiene then he or may he may or she may not floss the teeth properly and that can happen in with with or without fixed retainer actually so if a patient does not have poor oral hygiene no no retainer can really help him or her so if those people where the ability to floss is hampered fixed retainer is not this is one modification of fixed retainer where we can see that there are u patterns this is these 
downward u bends are in areas of interdental papilla this is to avoid interference during flossing this is a modification that helps make sure that the patient flosses without discomfort Next, we have removable retainers. So there are n number of mod modifications of Holly appliance over here. We can see the classic Holly appliance. Then we have the transparent thermoplastic retainer. Then over here we have Bex retainer. is very simple and a sturdy appliance. It is very easy to fabricate, and the classic model has only two or has only three components. N number of modifications of Holly retainer as possible. We have Holly's retainer with C clasp. Say a molar is yet to completely erupt a C clasp. Another example over here is again the 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 wire components that cross occlusally are avoided by giving this kind of a retainer. Over here we have soldered element and that is kind of bypassing the occlusal surface. It's very similar to Beck's retainer. Over here we have polyethylene clear labial bow. So those patients who are very conscious of their appearance can go for these kind of modifications of Holly Cetina. Holly Cetina has many advantages. It is simple and it is sturdy. The main advantage is in the transverse dimension, it holds a connection. So say the main correction, orthodontic correction is done in transverse plane. Those correction can be retained by using this Holly Cetina. Maintaining oral hygiene is very easy because the patient can brush his teeth just the way he used to before he was wearing braces. Normally, there will be no change. He, has, he can floss the way he used to before wearing braces normally. Also, cleaning the holly supplies is also very easy. Just a toothbrush and a toothpaste would be enough. The modified holly retainer appliances where the wire components do not pass occlusally allow adequate space for occlusal settlement. And many modifications can be used for different patients and can be customized for the patients. Drawbacks as such, there are not many. The main drawback is that there is, there is a risk of rotational relapse. Because the, every tooth is not held tightly in position, the chance of rotational relapse is high despite giving Holly's retainer. But apart from that, there are no major disadvantages of having Holly's retainer. They are flimsy. So they are not sturdy enough to maintain the corrections that have been obtained in the transverse plane. You may think that those individuals who are wearing aligners for orthodontic treatment like Invisalign can continue to wear the last aligner as retainer and need not wear these clear thermoplastic retainers at the end of the treatment. Well, not really, because those materials which are used for active orthodontic corrections when during aligner treatment, they are very thin. They are not sturdy enough to retain the corrected position. So they cannot really be used for orthodontic retainer purposes. Now there's something called as active or passive retainers. Now all the retainers that we have discussed till now are passive retainers. Some example of active retainers are over here. We have got spring retainer. And over here we have got an example of functional appliance. This is an activator. So active retainer. The word active retainer is kind of, a, it's, a, it's totally opposite to the word retainer because retainer means maintenance. That's all it means. So maintenance of the correction that you obtain at the end of treatment is retainer. Why would you want active movement during retainer phase, isn't it? So you can say that active retainer is basically either meant for overcorrection of orthodontic retention that you have obtained or it is meant for slight correction of relapse that has occurred during retention period. One example is over here we have an activator which is given in a patient at the end of orthodontic treatment to slightly overcorrect. Say for example it's a class 2 patient who has undergone treatment and has been converted to a class 1. In such patients some amount of some amount of overcorrection can be brought about to uh, to avoid some amount of relapse that can take place so to bypass that relapse that you are predicting may happen you can advise a patient a retainer uh, an activator or a function or any other functional appliance as a retainer over here we have the the spring appliance so the spring retainer is an ex example where 
during retention say some amount of relapse takes place and patient does not wear the retainer then in that case interproximal reduction can be done on the tooth that has gone out of the arch and brought into the arch and the acrylic can be relieved on the lingual surface along the direction where we want the tooth movement to take place so that the tooth movement takes place in a desired direction. So it's a localized treatment of relapse with the help of the So when do we advise fixed retainers? Most of the patients are advised removable retainers or a combination of fixed and removable retainers just as a double protection. The cases wherein you can advise fixed retainer would be patients wherein the intercarine width has been changed or the lower incisor has been proclined or retroclined more than 2 millimeters. Another example would be rotational corrections. They are strong candidates for fixed bonded lingual retainers. Say there is excessive spacing between the teeth, diastema cases, poor periodontal health. They are also examples wherein fixed retainers are advised. So when should the patient wear a removable retainer? Multiple studies have been done. There are different regimes available. Some studies suggest that first three to four months patient can wear full day the retainer and then he can continue to wear the retainer for another 12 months only part time wear or night time wear of the retainer. Then there are other studies that have suggested that full time wear and night time wear have same effect. So just night time wear that is part time wear of the appliance is more than enough. Then how long should the patient wear in retainer? There is no specific answer to this question. But the longer the individual wears the retainer, the lesser is the risk of relapse. Please understand that relapse is multifactorial and it is unpredictable. It is impossible to predict which patient will have a higher relapse and will the relapse will be severe or not. Some studies have proven that 70% of individuals after the fixed appliance have been removed and the retention period is complete, experience relapse. Out of those 70, 20% have such severe relapse that they may again need orthodontic treatment. This again emphasizes on the fact that orthodontic retention is essential and the patient can continue to wear retainer at least during night time for as long as he can to improve the retention of the orthodontic correction. So in the next class, we can understand and study ferrous vision and interproximal reduction. That's all for today, guys. If you like this lecture, please click the like button. And if you're interested in learning more about orthodontics, please subscribe to the channel. If you have any suggestions or any questions, please drop them in the comment section below. See you next time.